A warm welcome to you wherever you are in the world, from us here in Jarrah People's Country. Well, do we have a story for you. But before we begin, please take a moment to subscribe to our website, which is free from behavioural algorithms. Head to artistsfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. In 2013, a team of science journalists working for the ABC Catalyst program released a two-part critical analysis of statin medications for heart disease. Their findings, amongst other things, revealed that statins were grossly overprescribed and were causing adverse events. Statins are among the most lucrative drugs ever sold, and before the pandemic, Pfizer's statin, Lipitor, was by far the best-selling drug of all time and had generated a total lifetime sales figure of $150 billion by 2017. In 2018, after a five-year gag order had ended, one of the researchers on the ABC's Catalyst team told the story of what unfolded after the program went to air. And we'd been working on it for several years, we'd interviewed hundreds of doctors, and we, um, we had a website that was dedicated to this series where we had extended interviews and peer-reviewed journals and all the stuff that you would want to support a thesis that statins were overprescribed. But then something very unexpected happened that we weren't um, prepared for. Someone within the ranks of the ABC, so not someone within our team, but within ABC Radio, came out saying people will die if they watch this program. Dr Swan is a big influencer in the Australian health media space, probably the most influential, many might argue. We know a number of people who opted to get vaccinated solely based on his opinion. But how many people know of Dr. Swan's business interests? In 2012, Dr. Swan co-founded Tonic Health Media, which later became Tonic Media Network. Tonic Media is an out-of-home advertising business and according to their website, have a long-standing passion for delivering insightful health and well-being information to Australians. Tonic Media Network is led by medical experts Dr Norman Swan and CEO Mr Richard Silverton. While Silverton is CEO, Dr Swan is the non-executive director of Tonic Media. In March 2020, as the pandemic was just getting going in Australia, Tonic Media Network launched Chemist to You, an online pharmacy delivery business. A month later, in April 2020, the ABC put out this statement about Dr Swan after presumably receiving complaints at the time. It read, Any accusation of a conflict of interest between Dr Swan's contribution to the community about COVID-19 as a journalist and the work of Tonic Health Media is unfounded. Dr Swan is a valued member of the ABC Science Unit. Rightly, he is highly regarded and respected for his commitment to independence and integrity. But in a startling omission, the ABC failed to mention Tonic Media's new startup, Chemist to You, in their statement. We are wondering why the ABC did not explicitly report that Dr. Swan is a shareholder director of Tonic Media Network, the parent company of Chemist to You. For 40 years, Dr. Swan has been a health reporter for the ABC, and today he directly profits from the sales of pharmaceuticals and other health goods. So do you think complaints to the ABC of a potential conflict of interest are justified? Dr Swan has been the foremost ABC science reporter throughout the pandemic. He's the go-to guy that many have based their health recommendations on over the past two years. And the very same guy who set the dogs on the ABC investigative journalists who uncovered the overprescribing in the statin industry. Here he is selling novel therapeutics to young children. It is a reminder though that getting five to 11 year olds immunized is as important as ever. Parents are very keen to get their children vaccinated in the most part, but they want to be reassured about vaccine safety. We can look to America for that, where the Pfizer vaccine has been rolled out for children five and over since November. Throughout the pandemic, Dr Swan, consistent with ABC coverage more generally, has repeatedly referred to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, as a reputable source of information. Yet, 
there are growing concerns about this American institution and its influences on Australian health and well-being. Earlier this year, the head of the Department of Pharmacy Practice at the University of Connecticut, Professor C. Michael Wright, wrote a critical piece on the FDA in the conversation. The piece was called, Why is the FDA funded in part by the companies it regulates? In a recent video, we expose poor scholarship and media bias in a piece in the conversation. So we now tread cautiously with this media outlet. Nonetheless, after careful scrutiny, we believe that Professor White's critique of the FDA is independent and he has no conflicts of interest relating to this subject. Of the FDA's almost six billion US dollar budget, he writes, 45% comes from user fees, but 65% of the funding for human drug regulatory activities are derived from user fees. User fees are what the pharmaceutical industry pays to be regulated, and the FDA depends on these fees to exist. Professor White links to the FDA website directly with these astounding figures. So, nearly two-thirds of the FDA's income regarding human drug regulation is paid for by industry. The TGA in Australia has the same user pay set up, which ensures a financial relationship between the regulatory body and the industry. So why is this a potential problem? Podcaster Lex Friedman recently asked Pfizer CEO Albert Buller why he thought the FDA was pushing for 75 years before making Pfizer's trial data for their COVID vaccine fully available to the public. Do you have an intuition about why is the FDA trying to get 75 years to release the Pfizer data? They're trying to request that it will not be released for 75 years. And then maybe the broader version of that question is, do you think people should have sort of um, full transparency and immediate access to the data, immediate, you know, on the scale of weeks, not years. I think the relations with uh, with regulators, they have been always very transparent and there are a lot of uh, laws that uh, they are forcing uh, regulators to and companies to put out there their interactions and what exactly was discussed. Now, to, to go into specific details of... Uh, of some discussions, I don't know what is the reason that FDA wants to take the time, and but I'm sure they have very good reasons. Maybe Professor White could help out. In the conversation article, he tracks the trajectory of the FDA since it ceased to be publicly funded in 1992, when President Bush signed into law the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. From this moment on, drug manufacturers became the significant funders of the FDA and began to call the shots on the timeline for when the drugs could be approved. Professor White writes, while the number and speed of drug approvals have been increasing over this time, so too have the number of drugs that end up having serious safety issues coming to light after FDA approval. He links to this paper from several years back in which the authors conclude. New drugs have a one in three chance of acquiring a new black box warning or being withdrawn for safety reasons. We believe that the ultimate solution is stronger US drug approval standards. This paper was written in 2014 and instead of this recommendation being acted upon, there's been a greater slide in the opposite direction. Today, after using public money to conduct research for a new drug, Pharmaceutical companies can write up their own trial results, appraise them and keep the results hidden from public view. They also fund their regulators, who in turn also keep the trial results hidden from view. Dr Marcia Angel, a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School, likened the decision for the FDA to be funded by industry as putting the fox in the chicken coop. She writes, Nearly all of the money generated by these fees has been earmarked to speed up the approval process. So the majority of the budget is used to speed up the approval process, but it will take the FDA 75 years to fully disclose Pfizer's trial data. Marianne DeMarcy was the senior investigative science researcher for the Catalyst team, who reported on the overprescribing of statins that Pfizer and co have made so much money from. It was her career at the ABC that was eventually destroyed after Dr. Norman Swan's 
people are going to die if they watch this program comment, which led to an avalanche of attacks on her reputation. Dr. DeMarcy, now working as an independent investigative journalist, has been writing important critical pieces throughout the pandemic. She recently published an update on her Staten investigation, revealing the next chapter in the story of this industry, the arrival of non-prescription statins. After Dr. Swan spoke out against DeMarcy and her colleagues, the ABC ran an investigation into the program. Here's DeMarcy telling what the ABC found out. Uh, the important findings were that um, these programs were important for public debate uh, and that they had not unduly harmed people and that they were to stay up because they were a valuable resource for people. So that was the ABC's own review recommendations. Then something again unexpected happened. The ABC, without warning, without compunction, banned the programs. They shut down the website and they replaced it with an apology. And we were shocked because we weren't even told that our own network was going to do this. And so, you know, we went through a period of time of just not understanding why the ABC would do this. And um, we just felt that it was really uh, weak of them to cower to this industry pressure. While businessman Dr. Swan gets so much critical airtime on the ABC, a non-industry influence story of COVID is near impossible to find. We believe it is fair to say that the great majority of the public has little idea of the extent the ABC is captured by industry interests and political pressure. Demoting critical thinkers like Dr. DeMarcy from public institutions like the ABC, while elevating businessmen like Dr. Swan, seem to be part and parcel of this ever-expanding pattern of corporatism. That is, the collusion of state and corporate interests that so pervade society today. Such a response where on the one hand Big Pharma profits with tens of billions of dollars, while on the other the public has to endure divisive segregation policies, authoritarian restrictions, leaky vaccines with largely unacknowledged adverse events, and now a new vaccine-resistant variant in Omicron. As this recent graph from Ontario Public Health System in Canada shows, fully vaccinated people have higher rates of infection. Rather than seeing Omicron with its highly infectious though milder characteristics as an opportunity to reach innate or natural herd immunity, science influencers like Dr. Swan are pushing for more jabs. Boosters do work and uh, we need to get them. Uh, five months is really a decision based on Delta, not Omicron. Um, Omicron looks as though you really are pushing, you've got to push the boosters much earlier. It's a question of how long you wait. Uh, you don't want to hang around too long to make the decision because it's already growing in Australia. And remember, exponential growth starts like that, and then eventually shoots up like that. When a health reporter is also a health product businessman, the blurring of the line between health and profit occurs quite naturally. This blurring sums up our culture today. Here's an example. What follows is an advertorial in Murdoch'sNews.com for Dr. Swan and Co's Chemist to You called The Clever Startup That's Doing Away with Queuing at the Pharmacy. Here's the opening statement. With their app launch, Chemist to You was attempting to fill a gap in the market that disproportionately inconvenienced vulnerable Aussies. The use of the word vulnerable has been a conspicuous language choice throughout this pandemic. In a previous video, we looked into the role behavioural insight psychologists have played over the past two years, working with governments and business to send messages that are impactful. We examined the manipulative and paternalistic nature of behavioural insights teams. So to see this term as part of the behavioural messaging in Chemist to You is unsurprising to us. The use of behavioural insights is confirmed when you get to the bottom of the advertorial where the fine print reads. We collect information about the content, including ads you use across this site, and use it to make both advertising and content more relevant to you on our network and other sites. This is also known as online behavioural advertising. This is also known as data mining and manipulation. We cannot underestimate the level of manipulation, coercion and paternalism that the Australian public has endured during this pandemic. 
What a perfect scenario it has been to ramp up society's dependency on what we call Big Pharma's illness industry. While people are frightened, you can sell them anything, whether they need it or not. Because we can no longer trust the ABC for reasons described in this video, we instead read the literature from the world's scientific journals and look for rigorous analysis from truly independent science reporters such as Marianne de Marcy. Those who have the courage to stick their necks out, ask badass questions and not self-censor or free lunch with industry are the reporters, scientists and commentators who we are so grateful for. And we're also grateful to government bodies such as Japan's Ministry for Health who say, please do not force anyone in your workplace or those around you to be vaccinated and do not discriminate against those who have not been vaccinated. As we have come to understand in this pandemic, unvaccinated people are not a threat to society. We are instead a threat to tyranny. Well, that's the wrap for the week. Please feel free to support our work by visiting our website and clicking on the support tab. Thank you to the generous folk who contributed last week, helping us to continue to produce these videos.